Hello, welcome to Philosophy Roulette 134, where we read and review random philosophy papers we find online. See what is good today. What's new today? Who knows if it's good? <laughs> They're all good. They're all published stuff, so everything's good, regardless of what I might say. <laughs> uh, agriculture and human values, you publish an amazing amount of stuff. But I mean, it's like I'm not reading about redesigning agricultural food systems. Yeah, in society you also publish a lot. Yeah, I've, what I've noticed is that this, um, sometimes you get journals you don't know, like Angalaki. I have no idea what this is, so we'll take a look at that whole journal, see if it even loads. Sometimes these uh, like journals don't load, okay. But, um, you get your usual suspects of people who publish a lot, or just are always uh, putting stuff out. And then you get every so often somebody new. Um... So, history of science stuff, argumentation. Have I read anything in argumentation? Maybe I should check that, check out that journal. So, a lot of times the front page of uh, new stuff in Phil Papers is uh, the... Ooh, Asian philosophy. Maybe check out that. Constructive deviance. Interesting. You get a lot of the same things on the front page of Phil Papers just because they publish quite regularly. Why images cannot be arguments, but moving ones might be. You know, I keep seeing Akovic. This guy publishes a lot. Alright, why images cannot be arguments, but moving ones might be. I don't know why. It, uh, we'll see. And we'll take a look at other stuff. Asian philosophy. You know, I might just leave these uh, these journals open um, because... It would be, um, sometimes it's hard to find stuff, and I ha have to save some, so I'll look. So I don't know what Engelaki is. Um, maybe I'll take a look at them, and maybe also with this argumentation journal. <clears throat> so let's see what we got. The Digital Sublime, algorithmic biomes in a living foundry. Critical limitations, decades on shift to a digital culture. I have no idea what this is. Relational realism. Let's see if this is even at least available. Uh, people, you have to upload your papers. If you want people to read them, don't make it hard for people to read them. So look for some of the shorter ones. I eh? arrows and logos. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, well, it's long. I can't even write a short abstract. Date submitted. Kaufman. Chaos machines are evolving complexity. What is this? 1 to 20, I'm not reading that, and this is something else. New trends in social literary science. Hmm. Ontogenesis beyond complexity. I mean, was that 1 to 2? Was it a two-page review? Hmm. Nothing. whole lot of nothing. I mean, this may not even be like a proper, this looks like this might be a media studies journal. And so they may not even know about Phil Papers and to, that the philosophers might read their stuff if it were here. But <clears throat> they're probably right. I'm the only one that does this, so why bother? <laughs> uh, Pamela Anderson vul Vulnerability. Um, okay, we've got three pages on the great Pam Anderson who has done actually pretty good work over her career. Oh, but what's it matter if I can't read the story about it? Uh, Paul Ricoeur. I read her later writings. Oh, Pamela Anderson, not the uh, TV star? Oh, I guess that would be, I guess that would make sense. Why would? <laughs> oh, well. All right, I'm gonna find out what this journal is later. And, but, uh, I'll just drag that down here. I don't need this still open. Yeah, see, I got logic and anal analysis here. Um, unfortunately, I think logic and, and analysis, however you say it, logic and, an logic and analysis, and analysis. Um, I think it's gone, like, to, like, green open access, like, everything goes open access after five years. So all the stuff here I realized is, like, from 2013 or something, or 2014. Um, but... So I might look at some of their stuff. Uh, argumentation. Here we go. Let's see. Uh, let's go see if we can find something that's not so longer. 
Okay, so this is oh yeah, corrections. Um, this one is nine pages. Argumentation in Mencius. I would I always like reading stuff I haven't read before. So let's see what else we got. Gettier's ten coin example. All right, that could be cool. I always I do like me some uh, epistemology. Arguing terror. That sounds like fun. Fourteen pages. Uh, future of argument. Hmm. Of place and time. So this was a place and time episode. So let's see what we got here in argumentation. Come on, people. Make it available. Nope. Oh, this is so, oh, hey, I was like, this is so frustrating when I can't get papers. Okay, so we're going to do this one because it's available. Argumentation and the challenge of time, problem and temporality in the future of argument. Okay. So this is Blake D. Scott. And if you, if the folks in the chat, or if you show up in chat, if you're live, want to get the paper, you can click on the paper, this page link in chat. And uh, if you come later, you can type exclamation point paper and it'll, the link will pop back up or else it'll be in the uh, show notes below the uh, video if you're watching it at some later time. If you time shift as it were. Open, open, open. Okie dokie. And here we go. Okay, so. Introduction. In his inaugurating, <coughs> no, not in his. Inaugurating what would prove to be one of the century's most prominent philosophical problems in his 1905 lectures on time, Edmund Husserl laments the modern thought has failed to surpass or even match the great achievements of Augustine in grappling with the problem of time. What makes thinking about time so difficult for Augustine is its apparent simplicity. <coughs> for although we seem to know what it is meant when we speak about time, who can explain this easily and briefly, he asks. Who can comprehend this even in thought so as to articulate the answer in words? Well, you know, just looking at this question from uh, who can explain this easily and briefly, the one thing time is not is brief. So maybe there's a pro should ask and wonder but think about that. I mean, if you could explain something very, very big and something very, very brief. Now, the one thing time isn't is brief. Okay. It is in view of responding to such questions that the likes of Bergson, Husserl, and Heidegger, among others, had attempted to rethink long-standing philosophical problems in terms of temporal problematic. A temporal problematic. While this convergence of philosophical interest on time and temporality can be seen as common in theme in the 20th century thought, what perhaps was perhaps less common was the attempt to connect these philosophical developments and the theoretical and practical challenge that arise that they raise to more specific areas of study. Fortunately, however, this was not the case for the study of argumentation. Appearing in 1958 alongside the new rhetoric, Chaim Perelman and Lucy Obrecht's Titeka published a number of companion articles further developing some of the ideas that had been treated in the larger volume. It is only here, primarily in an essay devoted to temporality, that we learn the extent to which they had considered the problem of time to be central to the study of argumentation. As it is not immediately evident that Perelman and Obrecht's Titeka are interested in philosophical problems of temporality from reading the new rhetoric on its own, what I want to convey to argumentation theorists who might be less familiar with the whole of their work is a sense of just what is at stake in taking the temporal characteristics of argumentation seriously. I got a new mouse, so it's actually kind of nice. Uh, and you, well, it's like it lights up too, look at that. It's all like pretty. <coughs> <coughs> so yeah, it's nice to use. 
When approached from a temporal point of view, or so I will argue here, Perelman and Obrecht's Titeka philosophical contribution to argumentation theory can be seen as more than a historical footnote. On this reading, their efforts can be seen to initiate a philosophical rethinking of the nature of argumentation that stands to, as a live challenge met by contemporary argumentation research, which continues to operate with a largely static understanding of reason foreign to argumentation's dynamic nature. In short, the challenge posed to us today by Perelman and Obrecht's Titeka, essentially temporal understanding of argumentation is this. Given its temporal nature, how can we theorize argumentation without distorting the set of practices that we want to descriptively understand and prescriptively improve? After cl clarifying the way in which I interpret the, the philosophical intent intentions of the new rhetoric project, and what follows, I help. I will outline Perelman's understanding of time temp and temporality as it relates to the study of argumentation. This will involve taking a broader view of Perelman's work beyond the new rhetoric. Of particular interest will, here will be Perelman Obrecht's Titeka 1958 essay on temporality as a characteristic of argumentation. Here a distinction is made between internal and external temporality that helps to clarify the many ways in which argumentation is said to be temporal. From the vantage point offered by this essay, I will then show how Perelman problematizes a static view of a number of basic argumenta argumentative steps, argumentative concepts, by bringing out their essentially temporal character. Finally, I will conclude by drawing attention to a number of issues in contemporary argumentation studies that may benefit from a reconsideration of Perelman's analysis of time. The challenge of time. I would like to begin by addressing the question of how I will be interpreting the new rhetoric in light of Perelman's other works and collaborations with Ulbricht's Titeka. The reason for this is that the New Republic, as a standalone text, is perhaps less clear in its presentation than it could have been. Michelle K. Bolduc and David A. Frank, for example, hypothesized this may be due to space limitations impo imposed by the publisher. Whatever the cause, it remains necessary to justify not only how one approaches the new rhetoric, but also how one understands it in relation to the larger body of work in which it is only a fragment. For this reason, before discussing Perelman's conception of temporality, direct, temporality directly, I wish to make clear how I will be approaching the new rhetoric project as a whole. Exemplary of the interpretive difficulties surrounding the new rhetoric is the issue of its stance towards truth. According to some critics, given its central preoccupation with audiences, Perelman's framework for understanding argumentation cannot help but reduce the validity of argumentation to its effectiveness. Although this reading is plausible from a certain philosophical perspective, it neglects an important methodological consideration raised, among, among other places, in the introduction to the new rhetoric. Anticipating this criticism, Perelman and Obrecht's Titeka are clear that it is not their intention to study argumentation as a branch of experimental psychology and which arguments would be tested on various audiences in order to determine their empirical effectiveness. On the contrary, what they propose is, first of all, to characterize the argu different argumentative structure, the analysis of which must precede all experimental tests of effectiveness. Okay, so they're still doing philosophy here. Well, there may be may of course be a discrepancy between the, these intentions and their actual execution in order to be faithful to the aims of the project it is important that we study these differences, argue, these different argumentative structures in the way that they were intended, as philosophical concepts that precede empirical analysis. In this case, taking our distinguished author seriously means suspending certain epistemological assumptions that would prevent us from following their lead for fear that it might needlessly burden or even render impossible the task of evaluation down the road. In light of these methodological intentions, I will thus be approaching temporality, perhaps the argumentative perhaps the central argumentative structure for Perelman Obrecht's Titeka, primarily as a philosophical problem concerning the nature of argumentation itself. Okay, these people have a... starting to build up a whole bunch of, like, history to justify what they're going to say next. I mean, in terms of, like, this is, like, sta this is a big paragraph here. I mean, single-spaced, and it's, like, a big block on the page. Like, a big old thing. It's like, okay whole thing here too and a bit of this stuff up here it's like a lot they they seem to be worried about this clarification that is happening i wonder why i, I don't know this uh, literature but it just seems like they're putting some uh, solid effort into uh doing uh defense at the moment so 
it's interesting that you feel like you need to do defense because maybe they're going to say something that is unexpected coming up. And not that I would know what would be expected or unexpected, but it just seems that it's interesting that they're doing the defense a lot of defense first. You know, of course, some people put the uh, objections at the end, but uh, this one is putting the the uh, defense at the first at the, in the beginning. Okay. How then does Perelman understand temporality and argumentation, and why is it so t central to its study? In their 1958 companion essay to The New Rhetoric, Perelman and Ulbricht's Titeca make, make clear that the justification for the primary distinction between demonstration and argumentation rests on a temporal difference. It is precisely the, precisely the intervention. Uh, excuse me. It is precisely the intervention of time. They write that best allows us to distinguish argumentation from demonstration. The essential difference being that while time plays no role in demonstration, it is primordial in argumentation. How does time play no role in demonstration? That is really strange. Like, why would you say something like that? Time plays no role in demonstration. I mean, a demonstration is like, look here, then look here. Like, in a, uh, like a proof, like where you say, as is demonstrated, um, there's like almost always steps to a proof and there's almost always steps in pres uh, demonstrations. So I guess they're making some distinction between just show, like here show and uh, then like a steps is, anything with steps is argumentation, like some temporal uh, ordering is argumentation as opposed to just like look. Mm -hmm. Look, yeah. Okay. Unlike demonstration, which they contend is situated within the empty time of an eternal present, the authors of the New Rhetoric understand argumentation as form of action that unfolds within the full time of meaningful human life. What is at issue in this distinction is thus not only an attempt to, at clarifying the difference between two often confused notions, but more fundamentally a question of our basic philosophical orientation towards the primordial temporality of argumentation and how this temporality is reflected in our theoretical accounts. As it is not my aim here to defend the distinction between argumentation and demonstration from criticism, I raise it only to highlight Perlman and Obertaktaka's positive characterization of argumentation as being essentially temporal. Again, a static way of conceiving argumentation, Perel, against a static way of conceiving argumentation, Perelman's temporal understanding invites us today to, re to reconsider whether our theoretical framework of conceiving argumentation is temporally adequate to its object. By analogy, we could say that a te temporally inadequate understanding of argumentation would be something like trying to understand a film from a series of isolated snapshots. Although static, synchronic images of important scenes may in some cases be helpful to film students and critics, or even the casual viewer who thinks they may have spotted a poorly placed microphone in the last wide shot, these slices of time remain ill-suited to serve as representations of the film's essential di diachrony. When it comes to argumentation, the challenge that this diachrony presents is twofold. One, whether the theory that we bring to bear in interpreting and analyzing arguments leaves us with something that is faithful to the original problem, phenomenon, that is, the total argumentative situation, and two, whether the application of a theory imposes an oversimplified representation of argumentation back in, into the full time of meaning human life. Yeah, so this is more defense. I guess this whole section is, but... It's interesting um, what the authors are having to do here. So they've got, first they did the theoretical bit, and then they're coming in sort of explaining this concept. Like, this is what they said they were going to do, and then they're explaining a concept they were using to also show that this is what's going on here. Okay, so lots of defense, but I don't know against who or what. Although I do not claim to resolve these questions here, what I hope to contribute is simply an exploration and clarification of the ways in which Perelman and Obrick's Titeca understand argumentation in a temporal way. Such a clarification is necessary because argumentation, argumentation scholars, given their various disciplinary backgrounds, do not always share the same conception of argumentation, let alone a similar understanding of rationality. By exploring the way that Perelman and Obrick's Titeca understand the rationality of argumentation in terms of its temporal articulations, it should be possible for scholars to reassess the original phenomenon we are investigating and find ways for converging our efforts around it. My wager here is that rather than needlessly complicating argumentation, a temporal reassessment may in fact prevent us from oversimplifying it. 
Okay, so it looks like maybe this is what was at work here. This uh, They don't know who their audience is, the various disciplinary backgrounds, and not the same concept of argumentation. Um, so they're trying to narrow their scope, I guess, in this first bit. Or narrow their uh, reader's scope in the first bit so that they can uh, get people sort of on the same page. All right. The, the temporal structure of argumentation. If it is intervention of time that best allows us to distinguish argumentation from demonstration, the first question to ask of Karma and Obrecht's Taiteka is what exactly they mean by intervention. I propose that they understand time to intervene in argumentation in two ways, which will I, I will unpack in terms of a distinction between internal and external structures of temporality. Such a distinction, which to my knowledge has not been made by either commentators of Perelman or Ulrich Saiteka or argumentation theorists, should help us reorient our theoretical lens around argumentation's own practical articulations. For reasons of time and space, I will focus primarily on the latter. Okay, external structures of temporality. Oh, the external temporality of argumentation. Okay, by external structures, I understand Perelman and Obrecht's Titeca to mean the set of essential factors in any argumentative situation that pre-exist the actual argumentation. In general, these external factors function as constraints upon those engaged in an argumentative situation and can be considered as aspects of what is often called context. Okay, so context. Typically, however, these external factors are understood in spatial rather than temporal terms. Yet even in saying that argumentation takes place, that occurs or unfolds, we make explicit reference to a specific location and a specific time. These spatial and temporal references can be detected by, by, various, for, by a variety of means, the most obvious of which are linguistic and corporeal cues. Uh, linguistic and corporeal cues. That's sort of interesting, but okay. Beyond merely referencing time, however, Perlman and Ulbricht's Hiteka have in mind the temporal aspects of these, ex these external structures themselves. So the structures of context, they're saying. This includes elements such as historical, cultural, and institutional constraints which give a determinate form and rhythm to the landscape of any argumentative situation. These external structures temporarily constrain the choices of arguers and audiences. For example, concerning the choice of how much one should say at a given time, Perelman writes, Whatever the benefit of an accumulation of argument arguments, there are psychological, social, and economic limits that prevent a thoughtless amplification of discourse. This is the reason why each human group, each institution, has rules and limits to be re respected, which sometimes strictly regulate the time available for speaking. Okay. Another obvious, yeah, it's like you ever see the government, you, you, like, you have two minutes to speak. You know, the Congress in the United States, I don't know if other places have that. <coughs> I did see a uh, interview of somebody went on one of these uh, sort of uh, a uh, conservative talk show. And they, they saw, they, what they did was they studied his speech patterns a little bit before going on. They said, look, the guest, especially when the author, when the host doesn't agree with him, has about like 15 seconds to get their bid in before the guy just starts attacking. So he only gives you like something like 10 or 8 seconds. So the guy realized he had to get all of his talking points down to his bite size. And he had to be done before the guy would start attacking because otherwise he would just start yelling over him. And then his point would get mushed and the, uh, the host would like look like he was victorious because the other guy never got the guest never got to get the point across. The host always overrode him and overrode the guest, and in doing so, sort of just made the host look right because the guest never really articulated a, a good point. So the guest in that case is a some guy. I think he was an Indian fellow. Um, this is all I remember is what he looked like. He got all his points down, and he got all them in, and you could see that it completely unhinged the uh, host. And he said, he, even though the interview went, like, without well, he said, the guy said he'd never be invited back. Because it completely undercut the temporal uh, limits that the host was using to wrong-foot his guests. I remember that, that 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 clip really stuck with me. I was like, he was like, yeah, I just realized I had to get my points in in this time, and and 
once I understood the pacing of the show, he said it was really easy to take advantage of it. <coughs> okay. Another obvious example along the same lines here would be if Bolduc and Frank are right, the new rhetoric itself, which they report was originally over 2,000 pages before the intervention of publishers. Yeah, 2,000 pages is a little nuts. Similarly, in a courtroom, we can also see that there are specific rules that stipulate when and how for how long certain kinds of discourse are permissible. More spontaneous instances of argumentation, like those that take place over social media, are clearly constrained in different ways than those that take place in a qu courtroom, yet remains constrained in their own way, own way nonetheless. In all of these cases, what is clear is that the external temporal structures of argumentation remain in place and establish conditions in which arguers and audiences make their choices. Although a good deal more could be said about the externality, external, tempora, ter, external temporality of, in argumentation, it is a structure, internal structures of time that Perlman and Ulbricht's Titeca are less clear on and which therefore merit more of our attention. Moreover, as almost all non-formal approaches to the study of argumentation would agree that temporality is relevant in the external sense, it is in the second sense that I would like to emphasize as its significance has been underappreciated in argumentation scholarship. Okay, so there are external rules about time, but now let's talk about what are the internal things to argumentation that make use of time. Okay. Moving from the above sketch of the external constraints of time on argumentation, we can now look at what happens when these external temporal structures are taken up within argumentative situations. As I'm just going to just call these two pot. As P-O-T, as pot, suggests, the reason we need to make the distinction between internal and external temporality is that time affects not only the events and argumentation is meant to... Inf yeah. Not, time affects not only the events that argumentation is meant to influence or that which argumentation must take into account, but also the very intimacy of argumentation's structure. Translation modified. I wonder why. To understand argumentation's internal temporal structure, we need to first take a closer look at what it means for argumentation to be an action. Okay. From an internal point of view, temporality is an essential characteristic of argumentation to the extent that the set of actions we associate with argumentation, speaking, listening, analyze, evaluating, accept, all, etc., not accept, etc., all unfold temporally. To see how Perelman understands this unfolding, we can begin by situating his understanding of argumentation against the backdrop of his reinterpretation of Aristotle. <coughs> like Perelman, Aristotle also recognized the temporal aspect of rhetorical speech. As Aristotle writes in Book One of On Rhetoric, each of these of the of the three species of, of genres of rhetoric has its own time. For the deliberative speaker, the future; for whether exhorting or dissuading, he advises advises about future events. For the speaker in court, the past; for he always prosecutes or defends con concerning what has been done. In the epideptic, the pre the present is the most important. For all speakers praise and blame in regard to existing qualities, but they often also make use of other things, both reminding the audience of the past and projecting the course of the future. Despite this emphasis on the time proper to each rhetorical genre, Perelman breaks away from Aristotle by reinterpreting the centrality of epideictic speech. Unlike Aristotle, Perelman understands epideictic speech as the root of rhetorical practice rather than one of its branches. For Perelman, this is because the global telos of any action, irrespective of its local aim and consequence, is to intensify the cons consensus around certain values which one wants to see prevail and which should orient action in the future. It is thus because all actions have their aim, the intensification of particular values that Perelman understands all practical philosophy to arise from the epideictic genre of rhetoric. By reinterpreting argumentative action in this epideictic way, Perelman is effectively redefining argumentation by including its aim or purpose within it. By argumentation is talic in this way, because argumentation is talic in this way, it is possible to view arguments as having both temporal extinction and enough discreteness to warrant talking about them as separate acts. Okay, so doing like this sort of uh, keep the aim and purpose um, as the fundamental goal here. And so once we're looking at that, that sort of intentionality of what it's about, um, then I guess we have to take into account time for that reason, or we'll see why.
Okay. In the realm of rhetoric, Perelman defi will define the specific aim of argumentation as follows. The aim of argumentation is to elicit or inc increase the adherence of the audience to theses presented for their assent. By pausing to take a closer look at the concept of adherence in this de definition, I will now want to show how Perelman brings out its temporal character. Now this example can allow us to view some of his base other basic concepts in a similar way. While the centrality of adherence in Perelman's writings is well known, it is only in on temporality as characteristic of argumentation that its temporal character is explicitly thematized. Well, I'd hope so, given that title. What we learn about adherence in this text is the idea that a person's adherence always goes beyond the present moment. What I take Perelman to mean by this is that the concept of adherence is essentially temporal. In the same way that something like a promise cannot be understood without reference, without a temporal reference to a possible future where it is either honored or broken. With respect to adherence, this is to say that what a person is intellectually and effectively committed to at a given point in time cannot be reduced to any particular present. To put it another way, adherence cannot be understood independently of its past and future. On the side of the past, we, ad we, presently, adhered, we presently adhere to can be what we presently adhere to can be understood as a kind of personal precedent, as the past weighing on the present as a constraint on what we will consider to be argumentatively reasonable for myself and others. On the side of the future, we will find that adherence makes reference to a number of possible futures under certain conditions. We would be committed to acting in certain ways, given our current configuration of value commitments. All right, so here's where I think it's we're getting somewhere finally. The, the reasonability criterion is um, very hard. I remember as an undergraduate, one of the professors told me I was being unreasonable. I said, fine, tell me what being reasonable is. And uh, he got, I think, a little grumpy that I asked him that. He was like, you're being unreasonable. And I was like, well, what do you consider reasonable, especially in like a philosophy course? Like, what is it to be reasonable? So this reasonability here is given in terms of time. It's uh, the, the contextual and internal constraints on what is being argued. And, uh, and so these are the, the reasonability has to do with the particular argumentation at that, that point and the sort of internal constraints, what we adhere to, like the intentions of the argument from the people, from yourself and others, and also, I guess, I mean, that's what we're talking about, but it also, given whatever external uh, constraints that they were talking about, the author was talking about in the previous section, also does matter. So the so this is adherence is sort of the local, um, rel the relatively, lo the local relative uh, bounds of what can be uh, d discussed or um, given uh, in terms of the argumentative, argumentative goal. Okay. As Perelman's conception of adherence involves our attachment to particular values, it, shum, it should come as no surprise that these values too will be understood in a temporal way. As Perelman and no, P.O.T. explain in the New Rhetoric, the realm of values is a site of intense activity that is constantly being recast and remolded. Really? I mean, they ain't much values if they're constantly being recast and remolded. I mean, sure, over a long enough period of time, but like, I mean, day to day, do your values change that much? Okay, here they account for these changes in two different levels. First is the level of the particular values to which one adheres with some degree of intensity. The second level is that of the specific configuration or hierarchy among particular values to which one also adheres with some degree of intensity. Okay, so the the value itself and how it interacts with other values. Apart from the quantitative and qualitative changes in our adherence to values, POT are more interested in how here in accounting for the way in which these changes occur at a structural level. As we will see, the difference between these two levels is an important and recurring temporal structure in POT's analyses. I, will, I would argue that the difference between these two levels can be understood in terms of the distinction between the form and content of any process of argumentation. They would, but they're not going to. As they claim in the new rhetoric, POT refused to separate the form of a discourse from its content. Although they are also careful not to conflate the two, it is through the refusal to make this complete separation that they can distinguish between demonstration and argumentation in the first place. 
what, where the demonstrative reasoning characteristic of formal logics can make a clear separation between a logical language and its meta-language, those who are observing or engaged in argumentation will find this distinction much more difficult to sustain. Yet, if POT are correct, this is not due simply to human irrationality or laziness. There is a structural reason for this, owing to argumentation's internal temporal structure. I mean, from the logic side, too. You can make, you can define it to be clear. That doesn't mean they're right. The logicians are right. That just means that that's how they define their formal system. And, of course, you can do anything like that locally. But globally, um, there's always trouble with meta-languages. Um, that's how you get yourself into paradox, is why they do it very clearly, but that's the reason there's a paradox, is because you can't do it. Um, you can't keep them completely separate. Um, and if when you try to do it, you get yourself into paradoxes. Yeah, it's uh, girdle stuff. I mean, if you try to talk about the consistency of the consistency, you run yourself into terrible, terrible difficulty. So, <coughs> sort of the logician's dodge that everything's clear in logic. <laughs> well, the, the logicians, of course, know it, but, like, it, it's, um... Yeah, anyway. As P.O.T. observe in argumentation, not only does the existence of spontaneous argumentation cause reflection on the discourse to mix with the objects of the discourse, but this object itself is situated on levels of that vary constantly. Uh, again, with a new translation. What they are trying to get at here is the idea that unlike demonstration, argumentation cannot step away from its own shadow, even when argumentation shifts its attention from the object of discourse to the discourse itself, the effects of the shift remain internal to argumentation. What this means is that argumentation never has recourse to pre-given concepts and rules whose meaning and scope of application will fall would fall outside the motivating disagreement. The argumentation presupposes that there is full agreement about neither content nor form. Thus, where such first-order disagreements in formal logics can, in principle, be resolved by stepping back to the second-order meta-language, such disagreements in argumentation all happen within the same order, even if analytically we can distinguish between these two levels. Yeah, I mean, they're... You I mean, I agree with the author's use of the logic here. They clearly know what they're talking about if they can just jump between first-order disagreements and second-order meta-language in the same sentence, and, they, and it actually makes sense what they're saying. Um, so this is someone with some logical sophistication in the back in their uh, history. Um, the fact that you do that in the... Uh, logic is that's the whole point is that you're preventing your, you're trying to just clear things up so you don't run yourself into these troubles but these troubles exist specifically be, the whole fact that the first order disagreements in second order mad language is created is to ex explicitly worry about solving these sorts of problems of when you're talking about uh issues and then you're talking about them talking about them but in i guess in argumentation in, in some sense they're saying that there's a uh, you can't do that because it's always like flat there's only one level because whenever you're arguing there's just that you can't talk about the meta argument and the argument because that's just more of the same argument okay the important temporal difference for from demonstration here is that when it comes to arguing, the shift between these two levels does not involve stepping outside of argumentation, but rather involves moving forward in time along the same surface. Okay, so it's like when you you can't have both levels at the same time because it's in time. All right. Temporally speaking, argumentation... Uh, <laughs> They pull a little Mobius strip. Argumentation can thus be understood as proceeding along the surface of a Mobius strip, where form and content remain distinct without losing their fundamental unity. Okay, that's very cute. See, um, I mean, is this really helpful here? Um, it's like you turn one into the other just by sort of going in the looped time of your argument. I don't know, maybe. I mean, isn't this just getting yourself into the same Gerdelian paradox as you're talking about one and the other, and then you uh, sort of you lose your distinction at a certain point? All right. It is thus only through the unfolding of time within an argumentative situation that the interlocutors can switch between levels and back again. It is because these points of reference cannot be fixed in advance for all time that P.O.T. claim that this game of possible levels without any internal limit can be played indefinitely and is because the internal temporality of argumentation is unlimited in this way that it is socially necessary for there to be external limits, external temporal limits on argumentation, 
as we have already seen above. Okay, so you can, since you can't define it in the logic as you like uh, as logic does, you have to give external stuff. But is that really just a different form of a uh, second level? It's just it's not in the argumentation. You know, it's it's not in the logic like it is in in first order logic and second order meta language. It, this is in the you've got the argumentation and then you've got social controls. Is that just your second order? Is this just a semantic shift we're using when we call it uh, external and as opposed to second order? I don't know. It might help to uh, understand that the different, the external might be exactly a second order thing. Or, I mean, not even second order, but there are multi-levels because it wouldn't be just first, second, third and this sort of thing. It would be different sorts of valences or dimensions that can uh, affect your argumentation and therefore in some sense first and second order in logic are just representations of this in a very sort of simplified manner. There might be some therefore interesting stuff to uh, use in logic uh, according to this analysis. Okay, bringing, by bringing together these various elements found among prominent Obrick Titeka's writings, I tried to find I tried to one clarify the difference between the internal and external temporal structures of argumentation, and to emphasize the importance of argumentation's internal temporal structure, which can be seen as the motor of argumentation's internal movement. Moreover, I have begun to show that there is more going on temporally in POT's understanding of argumentation that can be gleaned from the new rhetoric alone, which, unlike for philosophers and rhetoricians more familiar with their work, often remain the sole point of reference for argumentation theorists. To further illustrate this, I now want to briefly touch on a few other pro-Romanian pro concepts that should be understood in a similarly temporal way to the extent that they are also rely upon the same internal temporal structure. The rule of justice and the durability of the reasonable. <coughs> to reinforce the idea that the temporality of argumentation is not only a peripheral concern or of historical interest, let us take a look at one of Parama's most central concepts, the rule of justice. Perhaps here more than anywhere else, we can see the importance of temporality in describing how it is possible that we make normative assessments of arguments. Recalling that the maxim of the rule of justice is to treat essentially similar cases similarly, we can immediately notice a parallel to our earlier treatment of the concept of adherence. Like adherence, the rule of justice involves an implicit temporal reference. In this case, it involves, on one hand, making a retrospective interpretation of relevance in regarding what is essentially similar between the past and the present. On the other hand, in coming to make this ju judgment of relevance, we must also make reference to the future, which comes to the, constrain the way we can interpret the past. As the example of legal of a legal judgment makes clear, this is because our present judgment will come to serve as precedent for future judgments. In a word, the rule of justice involves subsuming the present under the past with a cautious eye towards the future. The rule of justice is thus fundamentally Perelman's way of accounting for how it is possible that the past comes to weigh upon the present in a normative, non-arbitrary way. Yeah. Sure, I mean, there's always precedent, precedent, like your memories have precedent for how you understand things here, and um, I don't know if you're going to call that like the uh, rule of justice, but at least rule of uh, rationality in some sense. I mean, the Bayesian sort of uh, concept goes to this too. Digging deeper, Perelman accounts for the weight of this rule by means of another essentially temporal idea, what he calls the principle of inertia. Well, <laughs> okay, so we got the physics concept now. For Perelman, inertia functions more broadly as a stabilizing factor in argumentation. It is what allows us to explain our application of the rule of justice to things that succeed one another in time. Uh, okay, that doesn't make sense to me at this moment. And how it is possible that we are able to treat new situations and those that have already encountered in the same manner. Yeah, so this is, uh, okay, so this is the memory argument, kind of what I was saying earlier. It is this, through this inertia, he continues, that previously used arguments constitute types of precedents whose value has been recognized because of their success and that have become models or schemes that we can consider reliable. Yeah, so it's Bayesian reasoning, I guess. 
The principle of inertia thus accounts for temporal, temporal durability of these models or schemes and how it, it is that we can rely upon them when forming judgments about the strengths and weaknesses of new arguments we encounter. As Perlman puts it, it is in this way that customs are born and give normative value to a habitual course of action. Okay, so this is a sort of a social version of uh, how we uh, keep normative by uh, customs, how we keep uh, public and private um, sort of traditions alive is because they give uh, normative value because they have seemed to work in the past. So cultural weight is this inertia is a cultural uh, inertia in some sense, personal and maybe public. What Promlin here is describing in temporal terms is a social constitution of what a community holds to be reasonable. Yeah, culture. At its most basic, the reasonable, the, the reasonable for Promlin can be understood as the space of possibility within an argumentative situation that constrains the choice that arguers and audiences can make outside of which they would likely violate the often implicit normative expectations of their audience. Cultural standards. Okay. Even in less regulated instances of argumentation than, say, a courtroom, the constraining force of this reasonable precedent remains. It remains reasonable for the interlocutors to hold each other to the same standards that have been applied to them. Perhaps unlike a legal trial, however, whether or not such a violation of precedent has occurred will have to be resolved within the argumentation itself, as we have already discussed above. Yeah, I mean, I've... Uh, it's I've said this to people. People have said this to me. It's like people you're arguing about something. They're like, look, that's off limits right now. You can't talk. You can't bring that into like a current argumentation. It's not what we're talking about. So it's like outside the. You. It's sort of like uh, what you're not supposed to do in certain arguments for whatever reason. Um. I mean, it might just be stupid in a court of law to say something that doesn't help. But like other outside of a court of law. Um, there's expectations of their audience and what should be argued. <coughs> Without recourse to a judge in most situations, argument would then seem to be lost in its own Heraclitean stream. Does it really? It's coming and going at the same time? No, I don't think that's right. Why would you say that? Don't hate on Heraclitus. Does this mean that the problem of time is insurmountable outside of the courthouse and other such institutions? Does this mean, no, I, well, as I said, cultural institutions hold outside the courthouse. And all the time, wherever you are, you're, you can't really escape your culture. Does this mean that the evanescent nature of argumentation leaves us with nothing solid to grab hold of? To see Perlman's negative response to such questions will involve introducing into our discourse one final concept central to his work. Beyond the stability offered by the principle of inertia, Perlman's second point of stability is that of the person. For Perlman, it is ultimately the person that serves as the point of relative stability in the successive succession of knots that he calls argumentation. It is because argumentation is invented by and for persons that it is even argumentation at all. It is only within, with personal validity that rhetoric is concerned. Thus, without an access to a judge, a god, or absolute reason to guarantee argumentation from above, responsibility can only fall to the persons who, in risking their commitments by arguing, prevent argumentation from slipping into infinite skepticism. Okay, so as the nexus of all the internal and external constraints, then therefore the person, the individual person, is what keeps uh, culture together. I don't know if that's... I, I buy that, but I mean, I, I see why you, one might argue that, that it comes down to the person in the end, even if a uh, culture is like a group phenomenon. I mean, you can still have like a personal culture, but I mean, it's a reasonable perspective to have. So there's nothing much to really say about that. It's just, you could argue that point one way or the other. The future of time and argumentation. The future of time. I mean, doesn't... The future defined in terms of time, but the future of time. Interesting. Okay. Almost done, too. Before concluding, I would like to briefly point to some of the ways that contemporary argumentation studies may benefit from a reconsideration of temporality. One obvious theme that might benefit from a return to some of Proman's ideas is the, the relationship between argumentation and narrativity. In recent years, there has been a considerable amount of interest generated around this relationship. Similar to what I have been discussing here, the role here re reflecting on the role of narrativity of narrativity and narrativity involving asking questions about the relationship between temporally extended units of meaning and their characters or persons implicated in them. 
Perhaps the reason for this is that to quote Paul Ricoeur, time becomes human to the extent that it is articulated through a narrative, narrative mode. On a similar note, Perelman's understanding of temporality would seem to suggest that beyond only using narrative as arguments, as some authors have discussed, a more general level at a more general level, narrativity is fundamental to argumentation to the extent that arguments aim at reconfiguring at reconfiguration of the narratives already operating in any particular self-understanding. Following the thread of Perelman's ideas of the person, those interested in the idea of virtue or argumentation may also stand to gain from thematizing the essential temporal idea of ethos. As virtue argumentation is concerned with the virtues and vices of character that grant a certain stability to arguers and audiences, it would be interesting to know in, a more, de in more detail how it is that these habits sediment over time through an argumentative practice, as well as how they might be undermined. Such analyses could help to supplement Perlman's account of the person, which remains rather underdeveloped. Along the same lines, scholars working on multimodal argumentation may also benefit from temporal considerations. For example, what makes something like visual arguments so interesting from a Perlmanian point of view are the myriological differences among arguments transmitted through various media. What, where an audience it, audience's attention is directed, and in what order, is central for Perelman in understanding how arguments are received. When looking at a poster, a television commercial, or a political meme on the internet, one's attention will be directed to the content in very different ways than the paradigmatic linear model appropriate to texts. Finally, important questions have also been raised about the new form of mediation that now house, direct, and incentivize our argumentative practice. What scholars interested in argumented, argument design point out is the extent to which the contexts in which we argue are constructed and gradually refined over time. It is perhaps here more than anywhere else that the level of what Mark Akos calls our argumentative realities that an essentially temporal understanding of argumentation is necessary. By shifting our theoretical focus from individual arguers and audiences to the dynamism of argument networks themselves, we can begin to study what, co what goes on behind the backs of those engaged in argument on the ground. Taking the study of argumentation in this direction, however, raises important questions about the agency of individuals within these networks and to what extent conventional understanding of reason and rationality remain relevant in the digital age. Okay, so that's just some nice... Uh, these are the uh, speculations uh, raised by uh, sort of taking this temporal thing uh, as described here. Um, yeah, because it's like, well, who is the person at this point? I think the last point was the uh, most interest. Well, I don't know yet. I'd have to think about this. But exactly what exact who exactly uh, where the ration our understanding of rationality is, um, because if time is has to be reconsidered in argumentation then also the notion of agency for the person is really what's um being raised here in Perelman's notion of person as fundamental with in these respects then we've got agency and rationality so how do we understand agency not just um yeah about the agency of individuals so that's really where it's coming down to so i, I was reading it but it takes a second to process sometimes. So it's agency and then derivatively reason and rationality. <coughs> I'm getting there. I'm slow. Conclusion. In this article, I brought together some of the various threads in Perelman and Albrecht's Titeka's work that attest to the continued relevance of their understanding of temporality for contemporary argumentation research. In doing so, I have tried to illustrate that their conception of argumentation is not only concerned with the external temporality of argumentation, but more importantly, its internal temporality, which essentially characterizes argumentation and allows us to distinguish it from demonstration. Above all, argumentation is essentially temporal because the set of social practices that we call argumentation, as well as the meanings of the concepts that we use to make sense of them, all unfold through time. The unfolding of argumentation through time prevents it from being understood as a series of externally related now moments that could be analyzed frame by frame as it were. 
Uh, although such simplifications can sometimes be necessary, we should always be aware that the extraction of argumentative data from the full time of its original content will sever many of the internal temporal relations that give arguments their full meaning. Warning against this, Perelman and Obrex Titeka work remains unmatched in its attempt to rethink basic philosophical concepts of argumentation in a way that is adequate to its temporal nature. As I've illustrated here, most interesting is their attempt to think of the difference between form and content of argumentation as temporal unity. This allows us to distinguish between the various levels of argumentation and analysis without having to impose a static opposition not found in the original phenomenon. Although such an understanding of argumentation marks makes its study markedly more difficult. At the same time, it closes off certain well-worn lines of thought. It also opens up new ways of moving the study of argumentation forward. What the analysis of time and the other themes discussed above all illustrate is a general recognition of the need for an increasingly complex picture of argumentation. For what all of these developments have in common is the intention of further complicating the traditional image of argumentation as it has been inherited from a particular line of philosophical thought that could only defend an external conception of reason by suppressing the corrosive effects of time. Corrosive effects of time? Today, some may still worry that such temporal concerns born out of a rhetorical rather than logical analysis ultimately remain peripheral to the hard-nosed task of evaluating good and bad forms of reasoning. However, as Ulbricht's Titeka reminds us, the virtue of a rhetorical perspective is that it provokes, even on the level of pure logic, a permanent dissatisfaction that can only be stimulating. At the level of argumentation theory, she adds, it has the merit of keeping us on guard against simplifications, which is worth bearing in mind for the future of the field. Yeah, I mean, I agree. This was, um, this goes to what I was saying, um, about when the author also uh, highlighted about first order and second order meta theory and how in logic you keep them separate, but this causes all sorts of uh, consternation and paradox when you try to talk about this stuff. So even, I mean, if someone says, well, if you're trying to do logical analysis, yeah, but like yeah, that's, to say logical analysis is in any way, shape or form innocent is wrong and very, very wrong. You've got terrible problems trying to define like concepts of truth and stuff that uh, just it immediately goes to paradox. So maybe coming at it from the rhetorical side and not the truth side may is a very good idea. <coughs> so I'm with the authors on that. I think I was already with the authors on that um, before reading this paper. So not a wasn't convinced, but uh, it's uh, I agree. <coughs> um, but I think this point was well made. I mean, I didn't, of course, I didn't know the point that was ma being made here. I just agree with the sentiment. All right. Um, so anything else to say about this? I mean, any questions from the audience, of course, um, are welcome. Please let me know. I'll try to answer it best I can. Of course, this is my first time reading it as well. Um, I did not like this paragraph here. I don't really know... Um, I didn't really understand the question being raised. Uh, that's a small beef I have. Um, what, what was going on? Oh, yeah, this is the problem. So this was the breakdown of Perelman's argument. Um, and so I, I see what, I mean, of course the author doesn't want to go into the breakdown of the argument where there was not enough uh, understanding of the person as they said. But uh, yeah, I guess if I had, under, if I knew more of the background, maybe it was not so, uh, weirder question, but I just don't know the background there. Um, I am always partial to having images in uh, philosophy papers. I don't know how much this one actually helped, but again, this was all also about the uh, logic stuff right here. And so this is sort of the paradox in a visual form and also maybe a temporal form. So maybe that's helpful in that sense. Um, What's the difference between a logical paradox and a paradox of like, this is sort of a mathematical paradox of uh, two sides. Cause I mean, assuming you can't actually just go around the edge. Um, so yeah, all right, nice paper. I'm not sure I have a whole lot more to say. Um, do I have anything to say about the main thesis? Like how do you understand time? Well, the difference between time is I guess comes down to this sort of thing where you're moving between the 
internal and external constraints, which can be viewed as the meta language and the object language, which is an interesting way to interpret time and breaks the logic. So then you get to yourself to rhetoric. Um, and then you say, well, then what is the stable agent that's doing this if you don't have the, sort of the abstract logician or um, you, you, don't, you no longer have like the outside constraints and inside constraints, then who is the agent that is arguing? What is the agent of argumentation? And that comes to the question of agency and rationality. Um, yep, yeah. uh, I don't know. But that's a good question at the moment, especially as they said, given the uh, future of argumentation and sort of the pictorial meme version that we have at the, in our current culture. Anywho, um, that's it for now. At about an hour, I hope to uh, see you. I'll be back tonight again. And then, yep, morning and night until the quarantine breaks. Everyone stay safe and happy and healthy. I'll be back later.